All right, so welcome to uh, today's class. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss a few uh, tools to get some interpretation or to build up some interpretation for uh, machine learning uh, methods. And we're going to zoom in particularly on the use of tree-based uh, methods, but the tools that we're going to discuss can, uh, can be used for any type of machine learning uh, methods that you would like to uh, explore. So you can also use them for a generalized linear model, you can use them for a neural network, uh, for any type of model, uh, these tools can be used. So what we're uh, going to do, or the content that I will bring in today's uh, session, is um, based on the article I wrote with uh, Roel Henkerts, Marie-Pierre Coté from University of Laval, and, uh, and Roel Verbelen. So we already worked with this article um, in uh, the session two weeks ago. So we'll just continue uh, using this paper and we'll dive into the session where Roel uh, presents several tools to look under the hood of these uh, machine learning uh, methods. So that's important. Um, on the other hand, if you want to see um, a nice uh, textbook on the use of these um, interpretability tools, I can refer you to the book by Christoph Molnar that you see over here, uh, which is a free online uh, book. You see the, the reference over here. So the tools that we're going to discuss today are also described in this book. So if you need a bit of more reading or if you want to see a different kind of explanation of these tools, I kindly refer you to this, uh, to this uh, source. Okay, so what is our mission for uh, today's, uh, today's session? The mission is twofold. So first of all, um, well, not first of all, because I switched, uh, switched the order, but we're going to focus on a more computational discussion of the use of uh, decision trees and gradient boosting machines in R. And we're going to focus on these uh, interpretation uh, tools for the machine learning methods, having a particular focus on our frequency severity data in the presence of different types of, of risk factors. So what I mean with that is we're going to take again the MTPL data set that we've been analyzing uh, earlier on and we're going to zoom in on how uh, are you going to use, uh, for instance, age of the policyholder in uh, these three based machine learning methods. What are you going to do with postal code? Uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of stuff. So that's what I mean here with the different types of uh, risk factors. So these can range from factor covariates to continuous covariates to spatial uh, covariates. So first, a brief recap uh, on the use of these uh, tree-based machine learning methods. So this is something we've discussed two weeks ago. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, regression trees as uh, presented by Breiman uh, in uh, the 80s. So here is Leo Breiman. I added uh, the picture of these um, uh, impressive uh, inventors. Of, of, of these tree-based uh, techniques. We're going to look at um, trees with a numeric response and we know that a tuning parameter in, in the setup of such a tree is a complexity parameter, here denoted with CP, which will decide on the eventual size of the tree and which will prevent us from overfitting, from growing a tree that is uh, too deep. Then on the other hand, uh, we're going to talk about random forests, also invented by uh, Leo Breiman in the early Nillies, where we're going to look at a collection of uh, deep trees built on bootstrap data samples. And whenever there is a split to be made in one of these trees, we're going to randomly pick M, uh, split candidate, um, M splitting candidates out of the available P covariates to decorrelate the trees. And then uh, the gradient boosting machine, invented by Jerome Friedman uh, in the beginning of, of the Nillies. Uh, there we have a collection of T simple trees of depth D, which are fit sequentially. So we're going to rely on what the previous step in our algorithm uh, built. And we're going to use the so-called pseudo residuals as a response uh, to do this um, sequential tree fitting to improve on the current uh, model. Okay, so that's a brief recap of what we discussed. These are the algorithms uh, we want to focus on uh, today, once again, uh, both from the interpretation side as well as from the computational side. 
Right, and one other thing that we mentioned in, um, in our discussion of, of pre-based uh, methods is that for our frequency severity analysis, which is typical in the uh, insurance uh, context, you will need to use uh, appropriate, suitable uh, loss functions. Yeah? And we know that classic uh, textbooks on tree-based learning or typical regression problems in machine learning, they use the squared error loss as the loss function or the mean squared error loss. Yeah? Um, which is listed over here, which looks at the squared difference between your observation Y and your uh, model fit F hat. And that of course has a link with the Gaussian deviance or the normal deviance, right? So what we uh, already discussed or our claim is that this is not directly suitable if you wanna use uh, frequency severity data, if you wanna build a model for frequency severity data. So we're gonna replace this uh, squared error loss with a more suitable uh, loss function. And that's also gonna be important in today's computational discussion because um, whenever you, you launch this tree-based um, uh, machine learning method for your frequency or your severity data, uh, you'll have to make sure that you pick their loss function, uh, specify loss function that makes sense for the data at hand, okay? So what are we uh, seeing here? We see our preferred loss function for the frequency data. So I'm gonna do that with a Poisson deviance and I repeat uh, the expression for the Poisson deviance over here, but of course this is not something you need to study by heart. Right? You just have to know the concept uh, of, of using a suitable um, loss function for frequency uh, data. Um, and for severity, what we do in our paper with the rule is uh, we work with the gamma deviance as a loss function. We also run our experiments with the log normal deviance. You can find these results uh, online, uh, but we prefer for, for the MTPL data set that we, we are working with, uh, we prefer the, uh, the gamma deviance, right? But just to make the point that uh, these are um, loss functions that we recognize from our discussion of, of fitting frequency and, and severity data. Um, and we're gonna use here uh, these uh, loss functions inspired really by these more traditional uh, actuarial loss uh, distributions. So that's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, then we added, ended the class of uh, two weeks ago. We ended our discussion of these uh, tree-based machine learning methods by looking at the tuning parameters and the hyperparameters that we identified for our different um, methodologies. So I, I, I take the overview here uh, again, because we'll encounter, um, or we're gonna discuss a bit more on these uh, today. And we're also gonna look at uh, really their tuning huh, in, a, in, a, in a computer uh, uh, exercise or in a computer setup. So if you look at the single regression tree, the tuning parameters that we identify are the complexity parameter, CP on the one hand, which drives the, um, let's say, which drives the size of the tree and which, which allows us to decide on how big the tree should, should grow. And on the other hand, uh, we'll have this coefficient of variation of the gamma prior. And that's something I will explain uh, later today. So this is something we didn't really dive into yet, but which we're gonna uh, see coming to life in, in the R code that I will cover uh, later today. There's also this hyperparameter. So hyperparameter means that I'm not actually gonna tune this parameter, but I'm gonna fix it at a reasonable value, either based on my own exper uh, experience or based on what the literature learns me. And here this uh, hyperparameter to uh, when I build a tree, is like referring to the percentage, the minimum percentage of observations that I need to have in a, in a tree and before this tree will actually start uh, or consider a possible uh, split. Yeah, so this is saying, okay, I wanna have 1% um, of my observations at least huh, before uh, considering splitting a particular node. If you then look at the random forest, the tuning parameters that we considered in our uh, paper is the number of trees, the number of split candidates, M, 
and we fixed the following hyperparameters. So you recognize the CP from the regression tree. So we put it to zero to grow very big trees. Uh, we use as the gamma prior 25%, so more on that later. Uh, we put the kappa equal to uh, 1%, so we know what that is. And the delta here is to inject the extra randomness, so that refers to um, how or which percentage of my data am I gonna, uh, am I gonna use uh, when building uh, a particular uh, subtree. Yeah, so that has to do with um, yeah, the bagging fraction or, or the use of uh, a particular um, randomly sampled subset of your data. If I then conclude with the gradient boosting machine, I got the number of trees, I got the tree depth as tuning parameters, and I got as the hyperparameters, again, this kappa, this delta, and now I also have the learning rate or the shrinkage rate, which is uh, 1%, so that means I'm gonna update um, my, my previous, um, my, I'm gonna update my uh, uh, model fit so far by multiplying the tree that I fitted to my pseudo residuals with 1%, just to make sure that I'm slowly evolving in the direction of, of um, in, in the optimal direction to improve my loss uh, function. Yeah, so this is something we all discussed uh, last week or two weeks ago, uh, only about this gamma prior. Uh, there, uh, I need to add some extra clar clarifications and I will come to that uh, later on to you. Good, any questions on that? Because that was the recap from um, the theoretical session on tree-based uh, learning. No questions, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Is that Kevin or not? Yes, it was again me. Ça va? Okay, so now I'll uh, dive a bit more into um, what we're gonna do today. So the sheets that um, which are starting from now are, are new sheets. And as you see here in, in the number of sheets, um, this is not too much to be uh, covered anymore. So let me first start. Yeah, you know that uh, we are our lovers. Huh? So um, we're gonna show you how to do this uh, stuff with R. Huh? And what I did here is I looked, or I, I give an overview. If you look at uh, what is available in this R universe, if you wanna do Poisson gamma regression, let's say, or Poisson gamma um, machine learning uh, models. So these are the different techniques that we encountered in, in the course. So we started earlier on in October uh, not in October, but in February, with generalized linear models. And of course, these are available. The GLM function is available in base R in the, in the stats uh, package. You can, do their, um, you can do their Poisson regression, you can do uh, gamma regression, so that's all available. We also encountered or we took a dive into the use of generalized additive models. So there you have Poisson, there you have gamma which is available in the MGCV package, which we explored uh, during the pricing analytics uh, workshop. And now if you wanna do a single regression tree, we're gonna do that with the R part package, which implements the um, classification and regression tree algorithms of, of Bryman and, and, uh, and others. But what you will see there is that for this R part uh, package, you only got the Poisson loss function uh, available. There is no um, gamma-like uh, loss function directly available. So that's a bit of a, a gap here, if you want, huh, in, this, uh, in this R universe. Uh, and of course, I'm going to show you how to, how to close this gap and, and how to get along with using the gamma deviance when you're building a, a tree. For the random forest, we have neither of those. Huh? We don't have the Poisson, we do not have the, the gamma. Uh, function available or loss function available in the standard R uh, packages to run random forests. And for the gradient boosting machine, we can do Poisson with the GBM package or the GBM3 package. And for the gamma, you have to load um, uh, the GBM package from the GitHub site of, of, of this guy, who is one of the maintainers or the developers of the GBM package. And there, if you want work with this um, GBM package from, from this particular GitHub site, 
you will be able to use um, you will be able to use a gamma loss uh, function. So I, I want to point you at, at this difference. Huh? Also, if you would go to Python uh, and use the packages uh, available there to run uh, tree-based uh, machine learning methods. Of course, because we are dealing here with a particular kind of response, huh? either the frequency, the severity, it's, um, yeah, you really have to be careful huh? uh, and, and, and check whether the package that you want to use has this kind of loss functions uh, available. And that's not so straightforward because, of course, we have this very particular kind of response data that we, that we want to use. Yeah. So closing these gaps, I've got a next uh, sheet over here. So as part of uh, Rule's uh, uh, work, he coded the what he called the dist, dist R forest package available from his GitHub and, and my GitHub site, which allows us then to run and to build a regression tree with a gamma loss deviance, uh, a random forest with a Poisson deviance, a gamma deviance, and so forth. Yeah, so this is an extension of the standard R part package, which opens it up to other types of, of, uh, of loss functions. Does that make sense? So the main takeaway here is even if you don't like to use R, but if you want to do Python, uh, my, my message here is just be careful and, and see what kind of loss functions are available in the packages that, that you're using, because uh, often, uh, you have certain gaps here if you want to do Poisson gamma uh, deviance loss function for frequency severity uh, modeling. Yeah. All right, having this uh, set, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to do the MTPL data set that you've been uh, working with earlier on in this uh, course when we did the pricing analytics workshop. Uh, with our GAMs and with our clustering of the postal codes, etc. So you have to picture that data set. And what I'm going to explain out is in, um, in the analysis that we did of this data set using the tree based uh, machine learning methods, how did we construct the tuning strategy? How did we build up a comparison strategy? And what are our findings? Uh, so that's what I, that's what I want to show you today, because we're, of course, quite excited about this uh, research and we want to show you uh, how we put this together. We take the full data set denoted here with the calligraphic uh, D and we're going to split the data set in six. Yeah. In six parts, we're going to do stratified sampling for that. I'll come to that later on. Uh, so that means you've got these six uh, parts of our data set here denoted with uh, D1 up to D6. And what we're going to do is we're going to build um, six different models. Yeah. And the reason why we built six different models is that we want to be able to evaluate, evaluate um, the predictive performance of our model on a test set. And we do not want to do it once, but we want to see whether if we compare this predictive performance among uh, different types of methods, uh, whether there is like a consistent, uh, a clear winner. Uh, so we want to have multiple test sets available. We want to build multiple models and let each model be evaluated on a corresponding uh, test. Be careful, uh, somebody is again, um, has again uh, unmuted the microphone. So what we do here, if, if I look at the first uh, data fold, then I'm going to use D1 as the test set, which is indicated here in, in red. And I'm going to use D2 to D6 in order to do my tuning. Right. And the way I'm, uh, how I'm going to do my tuning is with five-fold cross-validation. Because what you see here, if I, if I look at my uh, training set, I've got D2 up to D6. I'm going to zoom in on the training in fold one. And what I'm going to do then is a five-fold cross-validation. So in the first uh, run, I'm going to use D2 as my validation set. And I'm going to build my model on D3 up to D6. Then in the second run, I'm going to do D3 as my validation set and so on. So what you see here is the five-fold cross-validation to tune the parameters in the model 
that I eventually want to calibrate on D2 up to D6, and that I want to use to predict the observations in D1. So that gives me one model and one evaluation on my test set, right? But I said I want to do this uh, six times huh, to, to, to clearly be able to make a, a comparison in terms of predictive performance, etc. So when I look at data fold two, I'm going to use D2 as my test set, and I'm going to do my five-fold cross-validation on D1, D3, D4, up to D6, and so on. Okay, so that's the idea that I want to bring. So when you will later see my performance of a GBM or a random forest or something on my uh, test set, you will see, um, yeah, six numbers, huh? because I've got six test sets and I can evaluate uh, each of the six random forest models that I built on the corresponding uh, test set. I know it's a little bit complicated, but it's just to be able to evaluate the consistency of my different techniques in terms of uh, predictive performance on, on multiple. Uh... So here I copied um, the algorithm number three. If I would write down uh, the, the scheme that I had on the, on the previous uh, sheet, if I would write that down in pseudocode, I will get the algorithm number three from um, rules paper. So this is, I'm not sure if, if, if this is more clear than the visual or, or the other way around, but let me quickly go through the main steps uh, so that you grasp uh, the intuition here. So what we want to do is uh, we want to work with a certain model. This can be a gradient boosting machine. This can be a GLM uh, if you want. We want to have a corresponding tuning grid. So this includes all the parameters for this particular model that should be tuned. We split our data into six disjoint stratified subsets. Yeah, so I'm going to explain on the next sheet what the stratification means, but, but that's important here. So you do uh, split into six disjoint and stratified. And altogether, they form the initial data set uh, D. And then we're going to run with K over these different um, subsets. And we're going to leave out DK as the test set. And that's what you saw over here. For instance, in the first run, I'm going to use the D1 as my test set. And what I'm going to do then is for each parameter combination in the tuning grid, I'm going to use, um, let's say, L which runs over the six uh, disjoint data sets minus K. And I'm going to train my model, uh, call it FKL of type M class. I'm going to train it on D minus DK DL, right? So that is what you see over here. Huh? So if I zoom in, I'm going to train my model in the first step here on D3 up to D6. So I'm not going to use the test set and I'm not going to use the set that I put aside as my valuation uh, set. So I'm going to evaluate then the performance of this model on DL, right? And what is DL in this first line? That would be my D2, the validation set that I put aside. So if you evaluate this validation error, then you're going to run over all the observations in your validation set. You're going to evaluate your loss function there and you're going to divide by the size of this validation set. So that gives you a first validation error in my scheme that would give me the validation error here over the green uh, block. And then, of course, you're going to do that uh, five times. Huh? So in the end, you're going to take the average of these five validation errors, and you can use this validation error to pick the optimal parameters from your tuning grid then you know what these optimal parameters are and you're going to train your model finally, FK, you're going to train it on D minus DK using your optimal parameters. So that means you train the model here on the blue, uh, on the blue blocks altogether over here. Yeah, and you're going to evaluate this model to predict the observations in the test set. So you're going to evaluate your model performance on DK again, using, not, not again, but you're going to evaluate your model performance on DK using your loss function. And you do that by running over all the observations in DK, evaluating the loss function there, um, and dividing by the 
size of um, the test set dk. So in the end, what do you get? You get the optimal tuning parameters for each model constructed, and you get the performance measure for each of your uh, six uh, test sets, six models that you constructed. So that is in pseudocode how we put up this uh, tuning and comparison strategy. So it's, a, it's an elaborate scheme. And uh, we do that because, like I said, we want to be able to have a, a sort of um, consistent view on which of the models that we build for this MTPL data set, which of those models that we want to investigate gives me an overall uh, best predicted performance. Huh? So not just on a single test set, but a performance that is confirmed among, uh, along different uh, test sets. I think things will become more clear if we then really illustrate how this works and what the results are. First of all, an extra word on this stratified sampling. Right. So here you see what our stratification means. So when we build these six different data sets, uh, six different uh, disjoint parts of my initial data set, D1 up to D6, I'm going to evaluate the empirical claim frequency and I'm going to evaluate the um, empirical um, severity, let's say. Yeah. So what I'm doing here, yeah, or uh, what you see here, is that I set up the sampling in such a way that I get a comparable empirical claim frequency and empirical severity across the six different uh, disjoint data sets that I constructed. And the reason I do that is, is to make them comparable. And because if you would say, uh, I've got a very few policyholders who claim uh, four times or who claim five times, but if they end up in the same uh, subset here, uh, then they could really have a big influence on what I see in this uh, test set. Yeah? So here we choose to go for a stratified uh, approach where you see that the frequency and the severity is comparable across the six um, subset. Now, what do we uh, want to do? Um, well, I want to make the point here that uh, what we call classical statistical methods or classical statistical learning methods, they are highly interpretable in the sense that if we look at the GLM, if we look at the coefficients, we can give an interpretation to that and we can easily identify like who are the more risky uh, profiles or the less risky profiles and so on. If I look at my uh, smoothing splines in my, in my gamma, then I also get a clear interpretation there. Okay, it's an additive model and I can look at the shape of this uh, smoothing spline and get an idea about who is more risky or less risky. Now, of course, if you look at the machine learning methods um, that we discussed so far, this becomes more difficult in the sense that if you look at a tree, then it's still OK because the tree is highly uh, explainable. Uh, so we can see there what are the splits, uh, what are the most important splits and so on. But if we look at a random forest or if we look at a boosted tree, we're no longer dealing with a single tree, but we're using T trees. And this tree can T can become quite large. And so what if you have 250 trees uh, of which you take the average in a random forest? Or what if you have uh, 300 small trees that you add together sequentially like in a boosting machine? Then it's very hard to get a grasp on what these trees all together are doing with your uh, available features. So we want to look at a couple of tools that we can launch, that we can um, use in order to work with those uh, trees and with the um, effects uh, that the trees are, are capturing. So there is a clear need here for interpretation tools. And that's what we're going to discuss uh, right now. But I think it will become more clear if we now look uh, specifically at the results, uh, uh, because there you see, there you will see why it makes sense uh, for our academic purpose to set up this, uh, this elaborate uh, cross-validation strategy, all right? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look into different uh, interpretation tools. And the first one to start with is um, the so-called variable importance plot. So in the sense that when we build a tree-based model, 
then the, the method is going to process the variables for us, as it's going to decide itself which variables to use, which variable to split on, etc. So what we can ask ourselves when the tree-based model is built is what were now the most important variables to be used, right? In a GLM, in a GAM, we've got tools for that. We could do a drop in deviance analysis. We could look at um, the, the p-values corresponding to certain coefficients and so on. Um, so we, we can get, grasp some knowledge uh, on that, on the importance of variables in a GLM and in GAM but how to do this with a tree-based model. So what we're gonna do for a single tree is that we're gonna sum the improvements in the loss function over all the splits that were made on a specific variable. So here, if I focus on the variable XL, I think about age of the policyholder or something. And if I wanna know what is the importance of this variable X, XL in the tree T, right? So I focus here on a single tree T. So what I'm going to look at then is I'm going to consider all the splits in my tree. And if this split was made on variable L or XL, yeah, then I'm going to see what was the loss improvement that was created by this particular split. So this delta L is the improvement in my loss function made by the split in node J. And I'm going to focus only on those splits which um, were created by variable L or variable X, right? So the J that runs over here, this J runs over all the splits, so all the internal nodes in, in my tree, and we're gonna sum the loss improvements made by this particular value. So of course, you can intuitively know that the higher your variable appears in your, in your tree, yeah? the, the bigger it will create an improvement in your loss function. And if the variable appears more often in your tree, then it will also mean that it, it, it has, it really helps to improve on the loss function. So that is what you would do for a single tree. Of course, if you've got multiple trees, then you're going to average this uh, variable importance measure for a single tree. You're going to average this over all the trees in your uh, ensemble of trees. So this is what we would do for a random forest. This is what we would do for a gradient boosting machine. And this helps us to gain an understanding of uh, how important a certain variable is in our model. So let's see what we get here. Um, so this might be a bit, so this is a plot uh, taken from uh, our paper with, uh, with Rule. So what are we going to do here? We're going to look at the frequency trees at the left hand side, and we're going to look at the severity trees at the uh, right hand side. And we're going to do this for the six different models, uh, which we built, right? So that is referring here to the six different data faults. And we're going to see what is the importance of our different uh, variables uh, in the different uh, techniques that we explored. So we started with a single tree, we do a random forest and we do a GBM. And we're gonna see what is the variable importance in the different uh, models that we constructed for this uh, data set. Yeah. So what, do you, what is our conclusion at the side of the, of the frequency? So we see if we look at this ordering here, that it is quite uh, consistent in the sense that both the single tree, the random forest, and the gradient boosting machine pick up the PM uh, level, pick up the age of the policyholder, uh, the power of the car, the spatial coordinates as uh, the important uh, variables. Yeah. If you look at the side of the severity tree, you see that the results are very mixed. Yeah? So there is not a particular um, there is not a particular uh, clear important variable that pops up. So the conclusion here is that my results are not very stable and that it apparently is difficult huh, to identify clearly important uh, variables in, in the models that I construct for, for severity. And that's of course in line with more general findings in the literature, but also in our pricing analytics uh, workshop that typically it's more easy to find uh, explanatory variables, predictive variables, when you're building a model for fre frequency. If you're looking at severity, 
then of course you lose a lot of your observations because you can only work with those policyholders who actually filed a plea. And it's the so you 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 reduce the size of your of your data set uh, substantially, and it's it's difficult typically there to to find um, explanatory variables with a good uh, predictive uh, power. And that's in fact confirmed here because if you look at the importance of the different variables, the consistency among the faults, the consistency among the different models, you get very mixed results. So there is no clear um, winners that come out uh, over here. On the other hand, if we look at the frequency models, you will see that this is much in line with the variables that we also identified when we constructed a GAM for this data set, when we constructed uh, a GLM for this data set. So you pick up here the same, uh, the same kind of uh, variables. Yeah? So that's the first thing you can use. Uh, what is the importance of the, the different variables in my, in my model? Okay. If we continue, um, besides identifying what are the important variables, we also want to have a feeling about yeah, how does this or how does my, do my predictions uh, change based on the, the values that my variables can take. Uh, so, so what is the marginal effect of a variable on my predicted outcome? This is what we would do in a gum by looking at the smoothed effect. This is what we would do in a GLM by looking at the different coefficients that we fit uh, and so on. So how would we do this for a tree and how can we do this for an ensemble of trees? That's not straightforward huh? because we uh, do not immediately have uh, coefficients or something like that we can, that we can have a look at. So the tool um, that is often used here is the so-called partial dependence plot, or PDP. What we're going to do is if we want to uh, look at the partial dependence plot of a covariate, say, XL. Then we're going to evaluate our model predictions. So F model is the prediction delivered by my model. And I'm going to evaluate it in, um, in a value XL. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to average over the variables that my other covariates in my model, my other input features, can take. So that's denoted here with the vector xi star, where I'm going to run over all my observations in my training set uh, and average over all of them. So the way how you should see this is if you look at a training set and you want to evaluate, for instance, the PDP for age of the policyholder, then you're going to say, well, the PDP evaluated in age 18, for instance, is you're going to pretend as if everybody in the data set is 18 years old, right? So you keep the, co the other covariates uh, as they are in your training set, but you make everybody age 18. And then you calculate the model predictions and you average over all the observations, all the policyholders in your training data set. And then you make everybody age 19, age 20, age 21, etc. So you're going to evaluate this model a lot of times and run over all the values that your uh, variable of interest, in this case the variable XL, can take. And that will give you some insight in how does this, uh, what is this uh, marginal impact or marginal effect of the variable uh, age of the policyholder in this example. Now, a comment that we need, that we have to give here is that it's a kind of uh, global me uh, measure um, in which interaction effects can stay hidden. For example, imagine that half of your observations would have a positive association between your XL and your outcome, and half would have a negative association. Then these two would cancel here because you're averaging over all the observations in your training data and you would get a flat uh, PDP. So interactions hmm, can uh, stay hidden here, can cancel or uh, yeah, can stay hidden here and can be canceled out because of the averaging that you take um, over here. Okay, so let's first look into some examples. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go forward here and first show you some, some PDPs. So what did we do here? We evaluate this partial dependence uh, plot 
for the different or uh, for a few of the models in our study. So we look here at the GLM, we look at the gamma, we look at the regression tree, and we look at the gradient boosting machine. We do this for the frequency model, and we look at the variable age of my policyholder, right? So in each plot, you recognize six lines. That's because I'm working with these six different uh, folds, and I'm actually building six models. So I want to show how these six different models which we build, how they handle the variable age of the policy holder. The GLM and the GAM here, they were constructed uh, along the principles that we explained in the, in the pricing analytics workshop earlier on in the, in the course. So what I did is we used the smoother of age of the policy holder and then we bind this smoother using the principles that we discussed earlier. So what are the findings here? Well, first of all, you see that across these different data folds, the effects are very consistent. Yeah, so we uh, hardly see uh, any variability here if, if you look at the six lines in, in each of the plots. What do we see? That the regression tree, it's the simplest model in fact that I can build, so it's quite crude in the way how it approaches, how it's using age of the, of the policyholder. If we look at the GAM effect, then what we see here, it's of course very different at the boundaries compared to, for instance, what a gradient boosting machine would do or what the GLM would do, right? So if you see here, the GAM is extrapolating the effect um, towards the older, uh, uh, older ages, the more senior drivers. Whereas the uh, gradient boosting machine will just say, OK, I'm going to cap this effect because I don't have any more observations there or I have very few observations for very old ages. So I'm not going to extrapolate this effect somehow, but I'm going to let it be uh, flat uh, over here. So that's an important difference that we see. But overall, if you compare this effect of the gun versus the effect of the gradient uh, boosting machine, you would say that it looks pretty similar. Huh? So it really captures uh, the same kind of, of, of patterns and the more risky behavior of younger drivers. And then um, the local increase here huh, around the age of, of 45 between fifth, uh, to 50, uh, where we see that um, we have some parents probably with um, uh, children who start to learn to drive uh, and so on, yeah. Good, so that's what this uh, PDP for age uh, would, would lead us to. Uh, we can do something similar, for instance, for postal codes. And that's, of course, a bit of a peculiar variable. Also, if you look into the machine learning uh, literature, I would say you don't, I, at least I didn't find many uh, references in, in the literature on, on how people are using postal code information in tree-based models. Um, there are different ways to do that. So what we did is we actually used the let and the longitude coordinate of the center of the postal code. And we used that as continuous covariance in our tree-based uh, models. So that's what you will see over here. Again, we look at the frequency model because that's the most exciting uh, exciting model to, to look at. We picture the generalized linear model and how it's going to use a clustered version of postal code as we discussed it before. We look at the GAM, we look at the smooth effect of uh, let and long uh, of the center of the postal code. We see what a single regression tree would do and we show what a gradient boosting machine. Now, of course, here I'm zooming in on one specific data fold, data fold three. And the reason that I have to do that is, of course, I cannot put six maps on top of each other because you wouldn't see anything any more than. Here I could easily do that. I could do six lines per graph. But here, of course, there's only one map per, uh, per model that I can show at the same time. Of course, I could do it separately uh, for the other folds, but, but these results will look pretty similar. So what are some findings here? Well, if you look at the tree, you really see this rectangular structure. Uh, you really see this splitting on let and, and, and long coordinates. 
Um, so you recognize huh, these, this rectangular structure coming up. It's not very insightful. If you look at the gradient boosting machine, you're a bit in between us, huh? so you still recognize this rectangular structure, but you see, because the gradient boosting machine is gonna create an ensemble of trees, uh, so you see, or you, don't, you do not see it as pronounced as uh, with a single tree. Yeah. For the gum, we recognize our smoother, and then our GLM is this uh, clustered version of our, of our smoother. But anyway, I hope you agree that looking at this kind of plots uh, creates us some insights in what is going on. Uh, for instance, like Jonathan says, yeah, if I see how uh, the spatial effect is being treated here, this is something I do not want, uh, this is something I, I think it's, it's way too crude and way too much, uh, let's say, influenced by what's happening in Brussels or in, in, in Liège. And I want to go for um, another type of, 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 of model. Yeah. Uh, this is something that is also, uh, once again, this is very important for, for the kind of models that, that we are doing, because in the end, we have to uh, explain this model to a regulator or to, to other stakeholders. So we need to be able to, to give some to make some sense out of the uh, model predictions uh, that we deliver and, and the way how we handle the features in, this, uh, in these predictions. I'm going to go to a slightly different tool. Um, so going from the PDP to the so-called uh, ICE plot. So an ICE is an individual conditional expectation plot. So what we're going to do there is uh, we're going to look at, in fact, the building block in the PDP, but we're going to do that for each um, observation in my training set uh, separately. So this shows the impact of a variable on the level of an individual uh, observation, and this allows us to picture the uncertainty of the effect of the variable on the outcome, and this might also allow us to detect interaction effects. So the building block that you recognize here was already part of our partial dependence plot, but here we averaged over all observations in our training set. And so now we're gonna zoom in on one particular policyholder. We can do that for, a, let's say, a random selection of a thousand policyholders or something, and we wanna see how these effects uh, are behaving, whether there's a lot of variability or whether I can detect um, groups of, of, of lines that behave simi similarly, uh, et cetera. So if I do this uh, ICE plot, uh, for example, for the uh, bonus malus level, so we already picked that up as a very important covariate in our frequency model. So what you see here is what the regression tree would do, what you see here is what the gradient boosting machine would do, and the gray lines represent uh, 1,000 1, random policyholders uh, and their ICE plots. And then the blue line is what the partial dependence plot would give us if we average over all these um, uh, individuals in the training set. So what are a couple of findings here? So as expected, the regression tree is pretty variable uh, in the sense that the lines uh, do reveal quite some variability. Um, once again, uh, the effect is, yeah, is really a stepwise effect uh, because we do that splitting at, at particular values. With the gradient boosting machine, the effect is more stable. Uh, want to add here, yeah, the, the, the different lines reveal more the, the same kind of shape, let's say, but of course there are individual differences uh, because we have these uh, uh, differences between our policyholders and their, and their profiles. The effect is also a bit more um, going in the direction of a smooth line uh, because we have this averaging, no, not the averaging, but we have these multiple trees uh, which are being uh, taken together. And one other thing that I need to mention here is about the monotonicity of this effect. And so, of course, if you think about uh, the levels occupied in a bonus model scale, then the interpretation that you would give to that is uh, the higher you are in the scale, the more risky you or the more claims you reported in the past, so the more risky you are as, a, uh, as an insured uh, profile. So in the, um, if you look at what the different lines would do here, that monotonicity may not always be 
guaranteed. Huh? So if you look, for instance, at this uh, risk profile, you see that there is a drop over here and then the effect will increase again. So what people sometimes do, if you go to the implementation of a, of a gradient boosting machine or an XG boost, sometimes or what you can do there is really in, uh, impose a monotonicity constraint. So really ask the routine to fit um, an effect that is increasing or to fit to fit an effect that is decreasing uh, over this, uh, this variable. So that's sometimes, sometimes being done in order to make the capture defects uh, more, in, more in line with our intuition. We didn't do that here uh, because we really wanted to see how uh, the method would process this information without being pushed in a certain, uh, in a certain direction. So that helps us to, to grasp some understanding now, the next thing um, I want to discuss is what about these interaction effects? Uh, because you sometimes read, okay, these tree-based models, they're good at detecting interactions um, in an automatic way, in the sense that if we would have to include an interaction effect in a, in a GAM or in a GLM, and then we would have to go manually through this variable selection process and try to come up with meaningful interactions, etc. So how can these tree-based models help us to detect, to hunt for the meaningful interaction effects? But what we did here is, I think for the gradient boosting machine, we launched the results of a statistic or an interpretation tool that is called Friedman's uh, H statistic. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the partial dependence uh, effect, but now in a two-dimensional way. So we're going to look at variables xk and xl, say, and we're going to list the results of this um, Friedman uh, age statistic. And in generally, that would take a value between 0 and 1. Uh, so if you look at this expression here, if the two-dimensional partial partial dependence effect would reduce to the additive effect of variable xk and xl, then the expression in the numerator here would become zero. Yeah? So that would mean there is no interaction between xk and xl being picked up by my model. Right? But if, if I compare this um, expression in the numerator with the expression in the denominator, what I do in the denominator is I look at the variability of my two-dimensional partial dependence effect between xk and xl. And if this variability would be completely uh, explained or captured by the effect of the two-dimensional partial uh, dependence effect, then at this age statistic would go to a value of one, right? So then the denominator and the numerator would uh, become pretty similar, uh, would become almost equal to each other, because then this interaction effect will completely drive uh, um, the, the variability of the two-dimensional uh, partial dependence effect of xk and xl. So that's a bit, in a nutshell, the, uh, the intuition here. Uh, once again, if this reduces to an additive effect of fk and fl, then this goes to zero. If the interaction is really driving the effect, then the whole statistic would go to one. So then you have a very strong interaction between xk and xl. So that is something we can, we can look at here. And we did the calculations for the gradient boosting uh, machine. And not surprisingly, the strongest interaction that we detect in this way is the interaction between latitude and longitude. And of course, we know that these somehow belong to each other, right? So that's uh, not a surprise. And then you see other uh, interaction effects being picked up over here. And the ones that I list in gray here, these are the ones for which I will then uh, make a visual on the next sheet to see how, how these behave and what I can learn from, from there. And you see here, for instance, the interaction between fuel power of the car, age of the car, and power of the car, age of the policyholder, and gender of the driver, and also age of the policyholder, power of the car. That was the interaction effect that we investigated also with our, with our GAM and our GLMs that we constructed uh, earlier on. 
So if I make a picture, what we're doing here is we're actually going to do the PDPs, but now for certain groups. Um, and these groups are created based on the values of another covariate. And so that's one way how we try to get a grasp or get a grip on the interaction effects that are picked up by the model. So if we look at the partial dependence plot of power, but we now group the curve based on age of the policyholder, right? So when you detect then a, somehow a different behavior among these different lines that you construct over here, then that's an indication that there is an interaction between power and age of the policyholder in this case. So not surprisingly, I get here a, a quite steeper age effect, uh, sorry, a, a quite steeper power effect if I look at the younger drivers. And so that gives me an indication that it's interesting to look into the, uh, the partial depend, uh, sorry, the interaction effect of power and age of the driver as we've done uh, before. And also here, if you look at the interaction between gender of the driver and age of the policyholder, then you clearly see yeah, that male drivers, uh, young male drivers, are a higher risk, lead to a higher value of my predicted outcome compared to um, the other types of, uh, or the other, uh, the other drivers in, in, in my data set. Yeah, so this helps me to get a bit of a feeling about uh, what is going on. And I can use this age uh, statistic to sort of guide me into the direction of, of, of interesting uh, interactions to, to explore. And of course, um, this is just uh, the, the, the pictures that you see are the results of our gradient boosting machine. So this is just to open up this box uh, to, to see what's underneath, what's going on under the hood, which, which insights can I get? And what you could do as an actuary is, is, is use this, uh, these tools and the findings of this more complicated model, the gradient boosting machine, to find some inspiration in a kind of automatic data-driven way to guide you in the construction of your uh, generalized linear models, for example. Uh, you could use this if you have no clue about the interactions that you want to investigate in your GLM. You could first start with building a gradient boosting machine, look at these kind of plots, look at uh, the statistics, uh, the age statistics, and then and, and try to grasp some interesting interaction effects to, to explore. Yeah. More on that uh, later. So this is a tool to zoom in on the interaction effects. So we looked at the variable importance plots, the PDPs, the ICEs, and now the interaction effects and the PDPs constructed for certain um, groups of policyholders in order to explore these, uh, these interaction effects. Then I come to the actual comparison. Uh, so here you clearly see, at least in my opinion, why it was a nice idea to, wo to work with these different uh, data faults and to work with these uh, six different models that, that we built. Because what we do now is we rank the models based on their uh, predictive performance on the test set, right? And we do that here for a tree, we do that for the random forest, the gradient boosting, the gum and the GLM. So these are the different methods in the, in the comparison. And uh, we evaluate the out-of-sample Poisson deviance on the test set. And you know, with each data fold uh, comes this test set. And the fact that we do that six times now allows us to, to get a bit of a feeling about the consistency of our, of our findings. Uh, if you would build, if you would use a single test set, then you would only be able to rank five bullets here uh, on a single test set. So maybe that's not a very convincing indication. But now we see that, for instance, the gradient uh, boosting machine for frequency is performing consistently better across our six different uh, test sets compared to our other uh, techniques in the study. And we also see, like we discussed um, with Jonathan and, and as a follow-up to his question, what we see here is that this single tree 
performs consistently worse predictive wise than the other uh, techniques in, in our study. So that could also be an indication like, okay, maybe you want to put more effort in the tree, but maybe it's not worth to, to look there at more complex uh, or you know, alternative uh, implementations of, of, this, uh, of this tree. It's also not a surprise that our uh, GLM in purple and our GAM are so close to each other. Because the way how we did construct the GLM is really by binning and by clustering the effects that were picked up by the generalized additive model. So it's really a GLM that is driven by what the generalized additive model was uh, learning us, uh, as we discussed it earlier on. So that's what you clearly see over, over here. Now, if you look at the gamma deviance, so if you look at the severity models, then our findings are very different in the sense that there is no clear winner. And these lines, I cannot, in, I cannot spot a clear winner over here. And I also see that for the GAM, something strange is happening for data fold four, right? That's what you see over here. And what is happening there is that this GAM is gonna extrapolate effects. Huh? So this, this GAM is using these smoothers, they extrapolate. So what happened here is that in data fold four, in the test set, we had, I believe, um, a car with an uh, age uh, that is quite uh, different from the other ages uh, which were observed in the training set compared to this fold. So we really see here the influence of extrapolating one of our smoothers and creating a, a prediction uh, that is uh, quite, uh, quite wrong or, or quite different uh, from um, what we, I mean, what we would uh, actually uh, observe. So this was purely driven by the fact that one of the smooth effects were extrapolated uh, to an area uh, for which we didn't observe any data in the training set and led to a prediction that is quite off, that is quite wrong uh, when you compare this uh, to the actual yeah, and, and, and of course, stratified sampling is not going to help here because we stratified based on the outcomes, uh, based on the response variable. But this is created by an outlying profile in terms of one of the input features. If I remember well, it was uh, age of the car here, which was quite uh, different from uh, what we've seen in the, in the training set. Okay, good point. So what we do uh, to conclude here, uh, we uh, evaluate the performance of our models. Uh, so far, we did that with statistical measures, right? I looked at the out of sample uh, predictive accuracy, etc. Now, if you go to the paper, uh, you will also find a comparison in terms of economic measures. So you shouldn't study that. I'm not going to ask that on the exam, of course, because I, I will not treat it in the, in the class. But if you're really interested in, in making this comparison, not only at the level of frequency and at the level of severity separately, but if you want to make the comparison when you really construct the tariffs, so you multiply frequency with severity, uh, then it's very interesting to, to also read that section in, in the rules paper, because there you will find uh, the use of tools like uh, a Lorentz curve, a lift curve, uh, which is also explored in, in marketing and, and consumer analysis often and so on. So we bring there some tools that allow us to, to evaluate what's now the, um, the managerial impact if you construct or if you compare tariffs uh, which are constructed here uh, with, different, uh, with different methods. So our conclusion for uh, Poisson deviance it was clearly at the GBM, the GBM and then the regression tree as uh, the worst performing. With severity, no clear winner. So we have no convincing model there that is uh, way better than the rest. They're all performing equally, let's say. In terms of the lift measure, so if you really make the comparison at the level of the tariff and the way how the tariff is um, uh, bringing in uh, a classification for uh, segmentation of, of the profiles, then you will also see that the gradient boosting machine that was, was our clear winner. 
and the uh, re single regression tree is falling worse. Yeah? What are we doing right now? And that's also why these uh, pictures are here. So I want to mention you the, the package uh, developed by Rul, uh, which allows you to do the random forest and the single regression tree for alternative loss functions, interesting to, to actuaries. So there is the Poisson, there is the gamma, there is the log normal. And then this uh, strange robot that you see over here, that's another project um, we've been working on for the last couple of weeks. And that's the idea how to, let's say, how to simplify the GBM into a GLM, right? Um, so if you remember what we did in the pricing analytics workshop, then we started from the smooth effects captured by a GAM. And we used binning, we used clustering to simplify that into a GLM. Okay. Now the, the package and the robot uh, that, uh, uh, that, that Rule developed, um, that stands for a model agnostic, interpretable, data-driven uh, surrogate model, if I remember well. It's a very complicated name. But what we do here is we start from the PDPs so from the partial dependence plots, for instance, of a general, of a gradient boosting or of a neural network. And we use ideas which are similar to the binning and the clustering methods that we use for the GANs. So we use similar ideas to simplify the findings in these uh, PDP plots towards um, uh, a surrogate model. And the surrogate model that we build here is a, is a GLM. So that's a strategy that we outline to construct a GLM in a data-driven way as a surrogate model that forms a close approximation to what your um, black box model would do, what your gradient boosting model would do, or what your neural network uh, would, would do. So if that is something that is interesting uh, to you, uh, then I recommend you to, to have a look at the package because you find routines there to do that um, automatically, starting from your favorite black box uh, model. And the uh, paper that, uh, yeah, we've got a first version of this paper, but we're uh, currently trying to, to improve and to extend that a little bit. So this is a, a topic or a research project that fits in the idea of explainable AI, yeah, where you start with a black box model, and you want to translate the findings of this black box model into a more simple and explainable uh, model. In this case, uh, the, the, the tool from the comfort zone of the actuary, the generalized uh, linear uh, model. So that's what I wanted to show with the sheets. Um, we talked about interpretation tools. So we saw a couple of different tools to, to look under the hood of, of tree-based machine uh, learning methods. And, and we also discussed how you could launch a comparison uh, across different uh, methods uh, if you want to make um, a comparison in, in terms of statistical predictive power um, or in terms of more managerial uh, tools if you want to compare tariffs constructed uh, by different models. That's what we do in this paper. Yeah, so I recommend the paper as background reading material, but of course you should only focus on the sections that I actually discussed in the, in the class. The other sections, you can read them if you're interested in these topics, but I will not expect you to uh, be aware of those uh, uh, for the exam. So what I would like to do now is to guide you a bit through the main steps of the R markdown that I put together to explain on the one hand the working principles of a regression tree with R part and then the uh, gradient boosting machine with the GBM uh, package. I, at least in my uh, personal opinion, that helps to understand the ideas of, of, of the algorithms and huh? to see how this is, um, how this is done in a, in a coding exercise and, and how R uh, displays the output, um, works with that, and, and so on. Yeah. So once again, it's not about the syntax. Huh? Um, it's more about grasping the intuition behind uh, the output that you see being produced by uh, these routines. 
All right, good to go. Um, I will not be able, of course, to, to read everything uh, over here. I, I, I guess that doesn't make sense. So um, when you're processing this material, just take a moment to read carefully uh, uh, what I write over here. But this is mainly, once again, explaining the, the working principles uh, of the algorithms. Yeah. So if you look at this uh, R Markdown file, you'll see that there are two main sections. So the first one is that I'm going to illustrate the basic principles of simulated data set. And then we're going to go to this MTPL data set um, and, and, and show uh, how, to, how to calibrate a regression tree on, on that. So I think the, the interesting part here in the R Markdown is to, to see the basic concepts on the simulated data set. So let us start from there. So what are we doing here? I'm going to generate uh, my own claim frequency data set so that I know uh, whether uh, the expected number of claims is influenced by certain covariates. And then I'm going to calibrate a regression tree for this simulated data set. That's the idea. Yeah. So when you simulate, it's good to set a seed to make the results reproducible. So that's what I explained over here. I'm going to generate a portfolio of 500,000 uh, records, policyholders, and I'm going to use a couple of covariates. I labeled them here as gender, age, split, and sport. And of course, I need to generate values for that. So for gender, I will sample M or F. For age, I will sample a value between 18 and uh, 65. For split, for sport, uh, I will sample a yes or a no. Variable. So split refers to splitting the premium and sport refers to driving a sports car, let's see, right? So that's how you can put the data set uh, together. You've got the code uh, on, on Toledo as well. So if you actually want to run the code, you can, you can also do that uh, later on. So now that we have the input features, gender, age, uh, split and sport, what we want to do is uh, we want to create a lambda for our frequency model, which is depending on these covariates. And again, this is a simulated uh, setup, so we know how the lambda depends on the covariates. That's what we're going to do. So first of all, we're going to specify the structure for the lambda. And if you read the instruction here, uh, how should you read it? Well, we start from, let's say, baseline expected frequency of 0.1. And then we say, if you're a male driver, we're going to multiply that with 1.1. Uh, if you're a female driver, we're going to stick to the baseline. Um, if you are a younger driver, we're going to multiply uh, the lambda obtained in previous step with uh, 1.4. If you are uh, above age 30, we're going to stick with uh, the lambda as we obtained it so far, and so on and so forth. So these are the ways. Uh, how does lambda changes according to, um, according to the available covariates. So what we see here is that our expected claim frequency depends on age, on gender and on sport, but not on split, right? So split is an extra covariate we have, but it's not influencing the number of claims uh, reported. So we hope to pick that up with our uh, models that we're gonna build for the simulated data set. As a final step, of course, once we've got the lambda, which changes according to the input features, what we want to do then is we're going to generate the number of claims for every policyholder. And we're going to do that by picking a random draw from our Poisson with the specified uh, lambda. So lambda is going to be a vector of size 500,000. So I'm just going to ask to pick a Poisson um, random variable with um, the specified Lambda. So in R, you can do that as follows. So then I put everything together in a data set called data. So I've got the number of claims and I've got the values for my covariates. I could also put the lambda in here um, to, to create the data set. Yeah. So does that make sense? So it's a simulated data set. Um, I know that the expected claim frequency is not influenced by split, but it is influenced by age, gender, and sport. And the way how that is done is uh, specified over here. Yeah. 
So what we're now going to do is uh, we're going to fit a single regression tree to this uh, data set. Uh, it's claim frequency, so I want to be able to specify the Poisson loss function. Uh, I want to be able to do the pruning. I want to be able to construct a partial dependence plot, for, for instance. So that's the stuff I, I want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to use R and we're going to use the implementation available in R part. Yeah? So uh, we already encountered uh, regression trees in, in different packages. So think about the EV tree we used earlier on. Think about the implementation Jonathan uh, mentioned. So I guess there are multiple uh, packages available, strategies available to fit uh, regression trees. But the most popular one is what you have over here in this recursive uh, binary splitting or recursive uh, partitioning, the package R part. Okay. Now, if you look at the formula here, the main function call, it's uh, like this. So we have our parts. We've got a formula. So that's going to specify what is my response? What are my input variables? What is my data set? Do I want to use weights in my loss function? Do I want to use only a particular subset of my data set? Uh, which method do I want to use? And that's important because this method, that's the place where I have control of the loss function that I uh, want to use. And as you see it explained over here, we've got at this point as the possible uh, loss functions, ANOVA, Poisson, CLASS, or EXP. So ANOVA, that's for uh, getting a squared error loss. Poisson, that's Poisson deviance. CLASS, that's kind of a, a binomial uh, model or a binomial entropy uh, loss function, I suppose. And the X, that's something you can use for, um, for survival data. So that's what you have available in the standard R part. So the conclusion is you cannot do a gamma deviance here, oral or normal deviance. Now that's, for that purposes, you have the extension uh, produced by rule. But for this example, good enough, we can do the Poisson uh, loss function. What else is there to mention? You've got a few control parameters. And I list them over here. You've got min split. That's the minimum number of observations in a node in order to attempt to do a split. XVAL, that's the number of cross validations to be done. If you uh, want to uh, tune the uh, cost complexity parameter with a built in build cross validation strategy, you can do that over here by specifying how many faults you want to construct. Max depth, that's the maximum depth of the tree that you're building. Uh, so that allows you to restrict uh, how deep your uh, trees uh, will go. And then we have our CP parameter, that's our cost complexity parameter as we've been discussing it uh, so far. Yeah? So that, that is, that's the, the main essential things um, to be aware of uh, over here. So let's illustrate that and let's see how that works. Right? I sort of repeat um, the theory over here. And you can read that, but that's essentially what I covered in the sheets uh, two weeks ago. So do take into account um, that with the CP parameter, uh, it's coded in R in such a way that if you put the CP equal to one, you'll get the root tree. So without any splits. So the prediction delivered by the root tree is just the empirical claim frequency observed in your data set. If you put the CP equal to zero, you get the biggest or the deepest tree that is possible. So the CP, uh, you, you can let it range, say, from zero to one. That's the scale on which this uh, parameter uh, operates. Do remember that we have the Poisson deviance. We see that over here. And if you look at this Poisson deviance, uh, then, of course, you always have to be careful about the use of exposure. Right, we know that from the GLMs, we know that from the GAMs, so that's also very relevant if you're looking at tree based machine learning methods. Now, you may say, yes, Katrin, but in the example or the data set that you generated, there was no exposure. That's, that's true. So, we're, we're going to start with a very simple example where I suppose that each record in my data set has an exposure equal to one. But if we go to the MTPL data set later on, then we know that that's no longer true. Right? We know that there are different exposures uh, observed over there. So there I will show you in the syntax 
how you can deal with this uh, exposure. Because it, it is possible in the R part, in the Poisson uh, deviants, to include this uh, exposure. And in fact, what R part will deliver as a prediction for a particular node, that's the sum of all the claims observed over all the policyholders in the training set ending up in that node, uh, divided by their corresponding exposure. So if everybody has exposure to one, then we're just going to divide by the number of observations ending up in this, in this node, of course. Okay. A thing to keep in mind, how does the tree, uh, how is the tree built? The tree is built by searching the split that creates the largest drop in deviance. Now, how should you see that? You compare then the deviance in the parent node versus the sum of the deviance that you create by splitting that node into a left part and a right part. So that's in fact the drop uh, that you should uh, picture. And we're also going to see that in our, in our results. Huh? Uh, we're going to see uh, what the deviance is in the parent node and what then the drop in deviance is that is created. So I'm not sure if uh, you can follow me because the format of, of this thing is a bit um, different, of course, from what we've been doing so far. But does this make sense so far? Uh, so we generated a data set. Uh, we mentioned a couple of algorithmic essentials of the R part, and now we're actually going to run a few of these uh, trees and look at the results uh, produced by, by R2, again to gain some understanding of how this works. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I was thinking something about with the... Um, since we are using trees in that case, and we use a Poisson deviant, Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you can theoretically have like some some categories we are gonna have like a really really low uh, lambda, mm -hmm. and that the the prediction is gonna be by f of x i is going to be equal to zero. No, exactly, and that's exactly the reason why we need this tuning parameter that I didn't explain so far to avoid okay. that. Okay, thanks a lot. So now I have a good feeling because I have the feeling that I can actually answer your question now. <laughs> no, but uh, you're right. Um, and also here, uh, if you look at this deviance, and if you would predict an exact zero, you would divide by zero in the deviance, you see? So we need something to avoid that. And like Jonathan says, if we look at the predictions delivered by the tree, if we would end up with all um, policyholders ending up in a certain node for which we only observed zero claims, then our prediction would be an exact zero. And that's something we're going to avoid by adding a little twist to this um, to these predictions. And that's uh, I think that this is also the reason why I really want to show you how this works because it, if you if you're not aware of that. Uh, then you might be surprised by the predictions that our part is, is delivering because it's not exactly as I write it over here. It's with a little twist that I'm going to explain uh, right away. Um, so once again, my only goal is to show you a bit the highlights huh, of, of the implementation here and, and especially to bring you a bit of intuition uh, with respect to the, the output and, and um, the results that we get with this R part. All right, so let's do a first, uh, first tree, right? So we're going to do a first tree, and we're going to put the CP parameter equal to 1, which means I get the root node, and uh, a, a tree where I put the CP parameter equal to 0, which is a very big tree, right? So I, I first want to see how that goes and, and how R is, is producing that. So here you see my basic function call, right? So we recognize this uh, formula notation from our other uh, routines in R, GLM, etc. We put the response and tilde, and then we sum up the uh, covariance with a plus. So there is no need here to, to list an interaction, right? Because the tree will take care of that uh, itself. Uh, that's in contrast to what a GLM or a GAM would do there. You would actually have to, to specify the interactions you want to include. 
So we recognize this. Uh, we take into account once again, everybody has exposure equal to one. So uh, we don't care about exposure in this first example. We specify our data set. We specify that we want to do a Poisson deviance. And here I also specify some of the control parameters. Uh, most particularly, I put the CP parameter equal to one. So that means don't do any splitting. And I put the max depth, which is then becoming a bit redundant, but I will need it later on. The max depth, that would be the, the deepest uh, tree that I can possibly grow within the constraints that I impose uh, overall. I save the model as the object tree CP1. And I, when I call this uh, object, R gives me the following output. So it says, yeah, you started with 500,000 observations. And this is the tree. Yeah, so the tree has a single node. It's called the root node. I find all my observations in this root node. It's leading me to a deviance of 278 something thousand. And the y val, that's the predicted value in this node, that is in this case 13%. And the star indicates that it's also a terminal node, so no further splitting is done. I could also ask for a summary of this uh, tree. So you'll get basically then a table here. I'm going to discuss that uh, later on. Um, what we also see here is that we've got 500,000 observations. We've got as the events 65,000 something. So that's the number of claims, the number of uh, non-zero observations we have in the data set. The estimated rate, that's again my predicted value. I'm going to explain you right away how that is constructed. And I got the mean deviance. The mean deviance, that will be my deviance from here, divided by my number of observations. Yeah. So what I'm now going to do here is to show you where these numbers that you find in the summary where they're coming from. So first of all, if you look at the number of events, that's just the sum of all the some of the number of claims that I observed over my whole data set. So currently I had 65,853 claims being generated in this data set. If I then look at my estimated rate or my, my Y val, that's the 30% that you see over here, what is that number coming from? That's the number of claims divided here by the number of observations. So here that goes in the really classic way. Right? There is no, not this little twist um, that we've been um, uh, mentioning so far. You will see that popping up uh, later. Uh, what is my mean deviance? That's my deviance divided by 500,000, the number of observations. Okay. So that's my first tree for which CP is equal to, to um, 1. Now I'm going to move on by putting CP equal to 0 which means I'm going to create a very big tree. Yeah. So you recognize again the same syntax. The only thing that changes is that the CP is now equal to zero. Do take into account that my maximum debt is five. So I will grow a very big tree, but of course, um, a tree that satisfies this restriction. The fact that I cannot go deeper than uh, five splits. So now, of course, if you look at the output produced by R, you'll get a lot of stuff. Uh, so it's a bit complicated here to show that, but if we scroll through it, you'll see that you get up to 63 endnotes in, um, in your tree. No, not endnotes, but 60, 63 notes in total, endnotes as well as uh, internal notes. Yeah? So how should we understand this? We start from the root node. That's here. We have all our observations in the root node. We have a deviance equal to this value, and we've got the predicted value y equal to this, right? Then the first split that we do is a, is a split on h. That's here. So we first split on h, and we're going to decide are you above 45.5 years or are you below? So where do I find uh, the, the the left node that, that's coming with the split, well, then I have to scroll down. And here you see with number three, I've got my, my sibling, so to say. Yeah. So again, what do we get here? 
for all the training observations, for which my age is above 44.5, I get a deviance, uh, sorry, I get a number of observations uh, like this, I get a corresponding deviance like this, and the prediction is 11.2%. That's how I should read it, right? So I know that the number of observations here at the right side of my split, plus the number of observations I've got over here at the left side, that should in total be 500,000, right? So you can check that, you can check that yourself. If we want to know what was the drop in deviance that the split created, well, then we should compare the deviance that I have over here at the right hand side, plus the deviance that I have over here at the left hand side of my split, and I should compare it to my original deviance because that was apparently the biggest drop possible that I could create by making a split in this, in this algorithm. So that's how you should uh, understand it. Now, of course, if we then move on, huh? so within this, uh, this, this, this node where H is above 44.5, I can do a next split based on sport, yes or no, then a next split on gender, another split on age, and and a split on split, right? Of course, here I go, I'm gonna stop. So I see with the star here that these are my end nodes. Why is that? Because I restricted the depth of the tree to be equal to five. So that means I got one split, two splits, three splits, four splits, and five splits. So now I need to stop now because of the constraint that I imposed here in my control parameters. And here it should be fine, right? So here we have indeed this age uh, below 64.5 uh, and the empirical claim frequency of 9.71%. Um, so this corresponds, if you now focus on node 32, this indeed corresponds to the following specification. So we've got a driver age above 44.5, not a sports car, female driver, splitting the premium and younger than uh, 64.5. Right, so what we do if we empirically, uh, if we take the data set and we calculate the empirical claim frequency, then we get a number like this, which of course looks pretty similar to what we have in the output for node 32 of my tree, but which is slightly different. Uh, so you see it's 9712899, and here I've got 9713895 in the output of my bar. So what I want to explain now is where this difference is coming from. And that's exactly what this um, tuning parameter, which we didn't encounter so far, what that is, uh, is going to be. So apparently there is this extra parameter. Uh, it's called shrink in the, um, in the parameters that I can, uh, that I can give to my, to my, uh, to my uh, uh, R part of the And that shrink parameter is by default equal to one. But if I'm going to enlarge that shrink parameter, then my estimates that I obtain for my uh, output, for my response, are exactly going to co coincide with the uh, maximum likelihood estimates that I would expect, and the sum of the claims divided by the sum of the uh, exposure. So if we, first of all, rerun this experiment and we build the big tree but put shrink equal to 10. If we're then gonna look at the output of node 32, then we're gonna get exactly what I calculated here empirically if I would isolate all the policyholders in the training, in, in, the, in the training set, uh, which satisfy the specification of the profile uh, that ends up in node 32. So by putting the shrink to a different value, I see that I can really get to this empirical um, claim frequency estimate as some of the claims divided by some of the exposure. So, so where is this influence coming from? What's, what's happening uh, over here? So if you scroll down, you will see that I um, captured that uh, over here. It's also explained in, in Bruce's paper. So in fact, what the R part is going to do, it's, it's not going to uh, give me as the output the sum of the claims divided by the sum of the exposure, but it's going to add a little twist to that. And this, yeah, what I denote here with alpha and beta, 
Well, this alpha is in fact the coefficient of a variation of a gamma distribution to the power minus two. Yeah, so this k is in my notation here the coefficient of variation. I take the inverse of k to the power two, that would be my alpha. And this beta is going to be the same uh, coefficient, coefficient of variation to the power minus two, but divided by the overall mean claim frequency. So where is this coming from? This is what you would get if you would mix your uh, Poisson, your lambda in your Poisson, with a gamma random effect with a gamma prior distribution, right? And if you're gonna explore with that, so if we do the calculations manually, and if we put the coefficient of variation equal to one, as the default setting in our part will do, if I now calculate this expression for node 32, then I'll get exactly what is printed in the output of my R part uh, fit, right? So there is this little twist over here, which is driven by this tuning parameter, and the tuning parameter is here that shrink parameter. It's the coefficient of variation of a gamma prior that I'm gonna use in my uh, Poisson model. So by default, it's equal to one. So by default, you get this calculation which will avoid the problem that Jonathan uh, signaled uh, earlier on. So this will avoid that at some point you're gonna divide um, exactly by zero in your deviance, or at some point you're gonna get a prediction that is exactly equal to zero. And because you have this, um, besides the sum of the claims, even if this is equal to zero, you're still gonna add something here, which will avoid that you get a prediction exactly equal to. Uh, zero, right? So this shrink parameter um, that we can use, it's a tuning parameter. So um, you can put it to a suitable value uh, if you approach it as a, as, a, as a hyper parameter, or you can approach it as a tuning parameter and then explore uh, some meaningful values for this uh, shrinkage uh, parameter. So that was the one we had on the, on the sheets in our discussion of a single regression tree. We had this gamma uh, parameter, which is uh, the shrinkage parameter mentioned over here. Does that make sense? I know it was a bit confusing and, and sorry for, um, yeah, late in the evening yesterday, I rerun the R Markdown and I think I somehow screwed up my reproducibility. Uh, so I will try to fix that. Um, but in any case, you've got the correct, I mean, you've got a good version on, on, on Toledo. And I want you to be aware of that, huh? that there is this shrink parameter over here, which is, uh, we need to be aware of that if we want to be able to really understand why we get a specific number over here as a prediction in our, uh, in our uh, end nodes. So that's a little tweak huh, that I uh, wanted to cover. Um, of course, what is the remaining uh, step for us to do? That's the pruning of the tree. Uh, so how can we decide with the built-in cross-validation in our part, how can we decide uh, where we should stop or, or how to prune uh, the tree and, and, and go from the deep tree to a more um, comprehensible tree? So what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to look at a summary of our tree. And we're gonna look at the output that we get over here. And preferably you start with the summary of a very big tree. So in this case, I'm gonna start with tree CP0, where I put the complexity parameter to zero, such that I get a very big tree, right? So in this big tree, I'll get the following output in my summary. So I want to explain now what are the different ingredients in this, in this output. So first of all, I've got the CP parameter. And I've got different values of that, right? And what is striking is that if you look at the CP parameter, the last value that you see here, that is the one for which you actually built the tree. So in this case, it's zero because I, I'm, I'm asking the summary for this very big tree, right? And what you get over here is then how many splits were made, okay? So you go from zero up to 31 in this case. What is the relative error? I'm going to explain that right away. What is the cross-validated error? 
And what is the corresponding cross-validated standard deviation that comes with this error? And I guess it will not be a surprise that we're going to look at this cross-validated error, try to find the minimum there, or try to find the minimum plus one standard deviation, and use then the, cross, the complexity parameter that corresponds to this minimal cross-validation error or to this minimal cross-validation error plus one standard uh, error. That's how we can decide upon a meaningful uh, value for this uh, cost complexity parameter. Yeah? So a few words of explanation on that. Um, yeah, you get much more output here, so I'm going to skip that uh, for now, which is the output with all of the nodes, etc. We've got the variable importance, which we get immediately, and we can also picture the, the tree over here with uh, the instructions that I showed. Uh, over here. Of course, here the tree is way too big, so it doesn't make much sense to, uh, to plot it here because it's a bit overrun, right? About these variable importances, uh, you can get it immediately out of the R part. You can um, you get it here in, in let's say absolute values. If you then standardize or, or express this in a, in a relative way, uh, like I do over here, you see that age, sport, and gender um, are the important variables. And there is still some influence from split, but we see it's 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 very little and compared to the impact of age on sport, for instance. And that's also in line with what we initially put into this uh, simulated data set. Okay, but what I want to show um, as one of the last steps is this tree pruning with the R part. So of course, before you do this, you can play yourself a little bit with the uh, CP values. And you can run a tree if the CP value is equal to this value or this value and see what kind of variables are used in the splitting and which variables are not, etc. So you can, you can have a look at the output of these uh, trees that I construct here. Where there's a lot of output. You also see that if I make a simpler tree, then when I do the plotting here, it already makes more sense. And so here you get a nice uh, visual of what this tree is, is actually doing. Uh, here it's more easy to plot that because it's a, it's a tree that is not as deep as the initial one we started from. Yeah. And even here, if I put the CP value to a uh, larger value, then I get an even simpler tree. And for instance, here, no uh, gender covariate use, no splitting covariate use, just those uh, age and sport uh, covariates, right? So what are we going to do now? Uh, how to pick the value for the CP parameter? And I'm going to do that by using the internal cross-validation procedure that comes with the R part routine, right? Uh, that's the most easy thing to do. Of course, you can put up your own tuning grid, you can put up your own cross-validation scheme and so on. Um, if you want to do that, you'll, you'll need more time, you'll need more effort um, uh, to, to do that. Good. Um, so we're going to start with the tree CP0, which is our biggest tree constructed by putting the CP parameter equal to zero, and for which we said, okay, the maximum depth is five. So we encountered that tree already, and we're now looking at the summary. So you see here again, this grid of CP values, you see the corresponding number of splits, the relative error, cross-validated error, and the corresponding standard deviation. And once again, in this grid of CP values, the last value is here, the one, that you specified in your control parameters. So here, the last value in my grid is the CP equal to one, uh, to zero. Sorry. So what am I doing here? If I ask to plot this um, uh, cross-validated error, right? Then I'll get here the visual, which is a bit um, yeah difficult to grasp uh, any, um, any any differences here. But this is what these built-in plots uh, would lead me to. You see here the range of the CP values, ending with zero. And you see, as plotted here, the relative error, the cross-validated relative error. 
And the idea is that we'll try to find uh, um, minimum value for that, or that we try to apply this one standard error rule and find the corresponding cost complexity uh, parameter. So that's what I'm going to explain now a little bit, um, a, a bit more. So first of all, what you see in this um, summary of the tree is the relevant relative error. It's the cross-validated error and the corresponding standard deviation. So let me first say something about this relative error. Yeah. So what this er relative uh, error is doing, well, it shows me what the reduction is in the deviance by constructing this particular split. Yeah. So for example, I give, a, uh, give an example over here. If we look at the first value at my um, relative error, I get a value of 0 0.99641. And that's my relative error corresponding to the first split in the tree that I constructed over here. So where is this relative error coming from? That's what I get. If I would compare my initial deviance of the root node, that was uh, this number, 279 something and so on. If I create, if I compare that with the deviance in the uh, left and the right sum, uh, that I construct or uh, nodes which I construct by doing the split on H, the first split on H. And if you would go back to my output of the tree, then you would see uh, the deviance on the left side is like this, the deviance on the right side is like that. So if I add these together, I get the following deviance. So compared to the situation where I started from, only, is only a root node, I get a reduction in deviance. And apparently that was the biggest possible reduction that I could uh, construct. Now, what is this relative error telling me? That's then the, uh, the difference uh, in relative terms between the deviance after the split and the deviance before the split. So that's how you should understand it uh, over here. Yeah. So you could also check that for other nodes uh, in, in the tree. What if we look at uh, the, the pruning process? So how to pick the cost complexity uh, parameter. So what are we going to do? Um, our part by default is using tenfold cross-validation. Yeah, That is a control parameter xvel, which is equal to 10. So we get the results here of this tenfold uh, cross-validation. And we get the corresponding um, uh, errors yeah, of this cross-validation process and we get the corresponding standard uh, deviation. So I explain that over here. So what are we going to do now? We're going to use uh, either the cost complexity parameter that corresponds to the minimal cross-validated error, or we're going to do this um, cross-validated error at the minimum plus its standard deviation. And we're going to see, OK, for which value of my cost complexity parameter Am I still within uh, one standard deviation from the optimal value? That's what I. That's an alternative way to pick the um, cost complexity uh, round. So what I'm doing here is I pick the minimum, and I ask for the corresponding CP parameter. So I get the value over here. That's C opt, and then in the R part, you've got a function that is called prune. So what we're going to do is we take the initial pick tree. And we put, we say, okay, you need to prune it, and you need to prune it to the tree that is corresponding to CP equal to my optimal value. And then I plot the resulting tree, and I get something uh, like this. So this tree is not as big as the initial tree we started from. It's pruned by using the optimal cross, uh, by using the optimal cost complexity parameter. And what you also see is that it's splitting on age, it's splitting on gender and sport, but it's not splitting on split. And that, that's indeed in line with what we put into the simulated uh, data set. So that seems to work well uh, over here. Yeah. Um, besides this cost complexity pruning, as a final step, what can we do? We can ask for predictions just with a predict function applied to our optimal tree. Uh, so be careful, this tree opt, that's the one that I saved over here. Uh, that's the one that I uh, saved uh, based on this uh, pruning process. 
So uh, I can use it for prediction and I can list here then the, the F hat or the lambda hat that is predicted by my tree um, for this particular uh, data set. Now you have to be careful here uh, because typically these machine learning methods, they deliver a prediction for F hat, for lambda hat, not taking exposure into account. So they deliver a prediction uh, pretending as if everybody has exposure equal to one, right? So that's something you always have to uh, verify at which level uh, the predictions are uh, constructed. So in general, for the different uh, tree-based uh, methods in, in R, exposure is used in the loss function. But when you ask for a prediction, that is typically done for exposure equal to one. So if you you have to multiply with exposure yourself then if you want to adjust for exposure in the predictions. Okay. Here I also get the different rules uh, which are used by the tree and I get my different profiles. So of course the different profiles that I get over here, they correspond each to one of the end nodes in my final tree. So these are the rules implied by my tree. It's almost time, so let me just make one additional comment. Here you have the MTPL data set. And the only change I'm going to do here is to take the exposure into account. And the way how you can do that in our part is a bit, uh, is a bit awkward perhaps, but it's really by uh, specifying it in the following way. So this is how you say to our part, okay, you need to take this exposure into account in your loss function. And when calculating, your uh, predictions uh, in the end nodes. Yeah.